Hi everybody, welcome to your maths lesson for week four. This is lesson one uh, for year six. So today's learning intention is using mathematical operations to represent word problems. Now this is a word you might have heard me say a few times in class operations. You might have heard me say inverse operations or which operation do we need to use. Um, so our success criteria is recognizing what an operation is. So we have four of them, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are the main four operations in mathematics. There actually are more operations, but they're the ones we're focusing on this week. Your next success criteria is writing a number sentence to represent a word problem. So putting a word problem into a number sentence. And lastly, checking the order of numbers and the order of operations in a number sentence achieves the right result. So we'll have a look at that very shortly. Now going on this point about what an operation is, a mathematical operation is a mathematical process. So it's a set of steps to take to achieve a particular result. And as I said before, there are four main operations in maths, addition, subtraction, and multiplication and division. So we know that there's a relationship between these, particularly between addition and subtraction. They are inverse operations. They're the opposite of one another. So addition, we're getting a total which is larger than what we started with, and subtraction, we're getting a difference which is smaller than what we started with. Same with multiplication and division. Uh, one way of thinking about multiplication is repeated addition. It's getting larger. And you might have heard me say that division undoes multiplication. So it splits up the product um, and gives you the quotient, which is your answer. Now, this week, as we go through each lesson, I'd like you to think of maths as a language. So languages operate on rules and processes. So for example, I'm talking in English at the moment. English has its own rules, which we sometimes call grammar. So for example, adding a question mark um, at the end of a sentence changes the sentence to a question. So for example, the cat is hungry with a question mark, the cat is hungry, changes it to a question. So here, the question mark is kind of acting like a, um, an operation in the sense that it's uh, changing this sentence, it's doing something, it's uh, acting as a process. Uh, likewise, in another language, so we've got Python, which is a coding language. Uh, def here defines a function. Yep, so that's a block of code. So anytime you see that in the script, it's referring to a particular block of code and introducing that into the script. So it's acting as a process, just like our uh, operations act as processes. These two um, symbols or words act as processes in these languages. So now that we know what an operation is and we're thinking of maths as a language, we use maths to represent things in the real world in a mathematical language. Yep, so it's not all about solving problems. Sometimes it can be about representing a situation. So here we've got a problem. For a party, I bought 24 cans of Coke, 12 cans of Sprite and six cans of Fanta. How many cans of soft drink did I buy all together? So we've got this word here all together. It's kind of giving us a hint that this is an addition problem. Um, we want to find out um, how many uh, more cans of soft drink did I end up with um, after going to the shops and buying some. So we could uh, do the most obvious uh, number sentence, 24. Now we know the operation we need to use here is addition because we're adding more cans or getting more cans, increasing number of cans. So 24 plus 12 plus 6 equals 42. I'm reading from left to right. So that's one of our rules or conventions in mathematical language is reading the number sentence from left to right, just like we do in English. And we also have got the uh, equals sign here, which we know means the same as. Now we know that the equal sign can be anywhere in this number sentence, provided both signs balance with one another. 
but this is probably the most simple way of representing this problem in words. Now, I've got another five combinations here, and each of them achieve the same results. They each achieve 42. And we know that with addition, it doesn't matter which order you put the add ends or the numbers you're adding together in, they'll still achieve the same total. That's called the commutative property of addition. Um, so here I've got six different combinations I can use to represent this particular problem. Now, if I was being really persnickety, I could say you need to do the 24 first, 12 and six, because maybe that's the order that you bought them in. But ultimately I get the same result. Let's look at another problem. So at the start of the week, there were 27 Sharpies in the classroom. By Wednesday, 11 had stopped working and by Friday, another six. How many working Sharpies were left at the end of the week? So here we've got a kind of keyword here, which is left. We've started off with some Sharpies, 27, and gradually throughout the week, some of them have stopped working and I guess been thrown in the bin. So here, the order of the numbers does matter because I'm dealing with a subtraction problem. So the first number in the number sentence needs to be the, the number that, of Sharpies that I started with. So I'm starting with 27, um, but it doesn't actually matter which order the 11 and 6 go in because I still achieved the same result. Now on this side here, I've got number sentences and these number sentences are correct, but they don't actually represent this problem because we're starting with 11 Sharpies. Yeah, and this one we're starting with six Sharpies. We actually end up having negative Sharpies, which I'm not too sure how that's, how that's possible. But even though these number sentences are correct, they're not achieving the intended result. So we want to make sure that whatever number sentence we are writing um, reflects the uh, problem correctly. That way it'll get the intended result. So in our last couple of slides, uh, each of the problems only had a single operation or a single type of operation. So the first one was addition and the second one was subtraction. Here we have a a uh, word problem which requires a number sentence with uh, two or more different types of operations. So for example, uh, bike hire was based on a flat fee of $8, that's a one-off fee, and $3 per hour. How much did Amalia, shout out to Amalia, pay if she hired a bike for four hours? So we know that the $8 um, has nothing to do with the hourly fee. So I want to make sure that uh, I multiply the $3 by 4 to get 12, and then I add the 8. Now, there's two ways of doing this quite simply. The first one is multiply 3 by 4 to get 12, and add 8 to 12, and our answer is 20. So I can do that over two number sentences, nice and simple. But I can also represent this as a single number sentence making sure that I do my three times four first and then adding the eight. This is a much more efficient way of doing the number sentence rather than having to have several lines. For example, if this was longer, I'd need to have several lines one after the other with different number sentences in them to get my final answer. Whereas here, if I follow the rule of re reading left to right and making sure that my operations and my numbers are in the right order, I can get the right answer, or the intended answer, I should say. So here I've got my last word problem. Three buses are the first to arrive at the Overford PWSA. Each bus contains 25 students. Another bus with 20 students arrives. How many students have arrived so far? So let's think about representing this in a number sentence, but also in the most efficient way possible. So here, uh, with number A, 3 times 25, that's my first uh, lot of buses and students to arrive, is 75. 75 plus 20 equals 95. Yes, it's correct. It's probably the least efficient of these options, though, because it involves two uh, sets of number sentences or two lines of number sentences. Here, number C, I've got 
three buses, each with 25 students, one, two, three arriving, plus my additional 20 equals 60. Yes, it's correct. Yes, it recognizes that this is uh, three buses of the same amount, but it involves one, two, three, four, five numbers and one, two, three operations. Uh, looking at B, I've got three times 25, so that's my three lots of buses, plus 20 equals 95. So B here is my most efficient number sentence, and it only involves two operations, multiplication um, and addition. Now, you might be wondering, why are you talking about this? These are all correct, and that's totally fine. If we think back to that discussion about coding and about languages, particularly with coding, we want to find the most efficient way of coding something. You don't want to have a whole lot of lines um, of unnecessary code because it involves more processing power and it's actually quite unsightly or not very nice to look at. The same applies for maths. We want to do things in the most efficient way possible and we want them to be easily understandable. Um, and it's a lot easier to understand uh, B when it's shorter and it's only on one line. So that's one thing I want you to consider when I talk about efficiency in maths. Okay, so let's look at some of the main ideas from today's lesson, just to sum up. The first one is this word operations. So knowing that addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are the four main operations in math, the four main processes or, or set of steps that we can follow to achieve an intended result. Uh, secondly, the order of operations, the order in which we put these operations in some situations can change the result of the number sentence. So particularly with the subtraction number sentence, we saw how we got a negative result when we put the numbers in any, any random order. And lastly, when turning word problems into number sentences, we need to check that the order of numbers and operations, um, so the order of numbers and also we're choosing the right operations, achieves the intended result. So we can see the word problem there, um, we can calculate it in our head, but we need to make sure the mathematical language we are using and the number sentence we write um, is going to be understood by everybody. So uh, particularly people who don't have the word problem in front of them. You want somebody to look at that number sentence and go, okay, this is the story um, that this number sentence is telling me. Okay, good luck with that, guys. I'm going to keep all these maths videos or maths lessons in the one video, so you don't have to go through a whole lot of um, navigating a whole lot of different uh, video files in Google Classroom. So you can stop the lesson now, and then when you go to lesson two, just scroll, scroll forward until you get to lesson two. All right, I'll see you then. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to your week four maths for year six. This is lesson two. Okay, a little bit of a shorter lesson today. Um, we're looking at using grouping symbols in number sentences. So yesterday we looked at the order um, in which we put numbers and operations in a number sentence and how that can uh, change the answer or the intended result. Today we're looking at using these things called grouping symbols. So your success criteria, you need to make sure you do the operations in the grouping symbols first. And also check that using the grouping symbols achieves the intended result. Now, what do I mean by grouping symbols? Well, the reason why I'm using this term grouping symbols is because it's in the syllabus, but also people have different uh, words for the same thing. So you might know these as brackets. We use them in English um, or in our writing, I should say, uh, but some people refer to them as parentheses. Yeah, so you might hear them referred to as brackets or parentheses. Uh, same here. So if these are brackets, well, we've got brackets here, but these, if you think uh, the parentheses are brackets, they're called square brackets. And lastly, this one I think everyone can agree on is braces. So these are the three main types of grouping symbols that you will see in maths. Um, the ones we're going to focus on this week and today specifically are brackets or parentheses, this first one, and these square brackets here. Okay, so now we know what operations are. 
Um, and in maths, we have our four main operations that we're looking at this week, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. And we know what grouping symbols are. Let's look at the main rule for today's lesson, the main thing I want you to get out of it. In a number sentence, operations inside grouping symbols must be done first. So let's look at example one in this uh, peach colored square. So this is a number sentence without grouping symbols. Six times six is 36 plus two is 38. An example two has grouping symbols around the six plus two. So that means I have to do the six plus two first. So six plus two is eight times six is 48. I find it really useful, and this is a really good practice to get into. When you've got an uh, operation in a grouping symbol is to do that first and write it down on a separate line. So here, six plus two is eight. I've written the eight here and then multiplied it by six, making sure that my equal signs are all in line with one another. Example one over on this side, on the blue side, um, was without grouping symbols. And my answer that I uh, get is 58. But here I have to do these operations inside the grouping symbols first. So two times two is four plus two is six. Then I do uh, 42 divided by three is 14 times six is 84. So let's look at solving some number sentences with grouping symbols together. So here I've got four times five plus five times five. I need to make sure that I do whatever's in the grouping symbol first. So five times five is 25. Four times five is 20. Put my plus symbol in here, and it's really useful to make sure that everything lines up. My equal sign is gonna line up. 20 plus 25 is 45. Now, excuse the handwriting, guys. Okay, uh, this question here. Now I've got three times 12 divided by three times 10 minus five. That's quite a lot going on, but with my grouping symbols, I know what I need to do first. So I'll start with this one from my left. 12 divided by three is four. And then I'm going to skip this 10, uh, this times to times symbol here and go straight to whatever's in the grouping symbol. 10 minus five. Yep. Equals. Okay. And three. There we go. So three times four. Now it might even help to do another line here. Three times four is 12 times five equals 60. And there you go. I've done whatever's in the grouping symbols first and under each line I've sort of simplified it and then finally got my final answer. Okay, so now we know that whatever's in the grouping symbols must be done first. Uh, let's look at these number sentences and see whether the grouping symbols are actually needed. Now, the reason why I asked this question is because thinking of mind back to last lesson where I was talking about having an efficient number sentence, that's making sure we don't have a whole lot of clutter or things that are unnecessary in there. Let's look at whether we actually need some of these grouping symbols. So two plus five minus three plus four, I still read it the same way, but I need to do whatever's in the grouping symbol first. Five minus three is two plus four and two. So two plus two plus four is eight. Now let's look at if we did that without the grouping symbols, whether it would have changed. So two plus five is seven, minus three is four plus four, equals, sorry about the handwriting again, eight. So it doesn't actually change the outcome. So in this situation, we don't even need these uh, grouping symbols. It's just an unnecessary 
uh, addition that, or addition of grouping symbols, I should say. Let's look at this one here. Uh, six times six plus two minus eight. So I do whatever's in the grouping symbols first. So change uh, six plus two is eight. Six times eight minus eight. So six times eight is 48 minus eight is 40. Now let's look at if we didn't do the grouping symbols, six times six is 36 plus two is 38 minus eight is 30. So my answer has changed dramatically here. So instead of getting uh, 40, I've gotten 30 without the grouping symbol. So in this situation here, um, assuming this is the right number sentence, these grouping symbols need to be there. And this last one, um, six plus eight minus three times four minus two. So four minus two is two. Actually, sorry, eight minus three is five. Four minus two is two times So six plus five is 11 times two is 22. Um, now let's look what happens if we remove the grouping symbols. Um, six plus eight is 14 minus three is 11. So that hasn't changed, that part hasn't changed. Um, 11 times four is 44 minus two is 42. So it has changed. So in this number sentence, this one's not necessary, but this one is. Yeah. So really think critically about whether the grouping sentences, or grouping symbols are needed in your number sentence. Okay, so the main ideas for today, sorry that last bit was a bit long. Always do the operations inside the grouping symbols first and check that using the grouping symbols achieves the result that you intended to achieve, the one that you wanted to achieve. Um, and also, I guess on that last point, don't just throw grouping symbols in there because it's fun. Only use them where you need to. All right, I'll see you in lesson three. Welcome to lesson three, week four for year six maths. Let's get into it. Okay, so today we're looking at using grouping symbols, which we looked at yesterday, to solve mixed operation word problems. So that's a word problem where you're gonna to need to use more than one operation. You're gonna to need to use maybe addition and subtraction or um, multiplication and addition. And the success criteria here, nice and simple. Firstly, read the word problem. Make sure you understand what's going on. If you're not too sure, you could apply the cube strategy. You could draw a picture of it, but you really need to understand what's going in the word problem before you can start translating it into a number sentence, putting it into a mathematical number sentence. And lastly, check that the grouping symbols that you use um, and the operations achieve the intended result. That's the result that you wanna get from or the, the actual result rather than just having a correct number sentence that doesn't match up with the word problem. So just a quick reminder of the cubes strategy. Now, I know that not everyone in our class uses this. Um, but particularly for longer word problems, it can be quite useful circling the numbers so it's nice and visible, underlining the question. So what do I need to actually answer here? Box the keywords. Now this can uh, backfire sometimes, but it can be quite helpful as well. So some of the keywords like total usually means that we're referring to an addition problem or it's gonna have some element of addition. Things like left um, usually mean that there's some sort of subtractions. There's, some have gone away and we're left with some. Um, the E is evaluate and draw. Uh, so maybe draw the, the problem, but also think about um, what operation do I need to do here? Yep, and the, the key words might help you with that, they might not. And lastly, you need to solve it and check it. Okay, so today we're just gonna look at one word problem and see how we go putting that into a number sentence which uses grouping symbols. So a baby spider climbs a drain pipe from top to bottom in seven hours. 
Every hour it climbs 60 centimetres and then slides down 10 centimetres. How long is the drain pipe? So I might even use my cubes strategy for this. Firstly, I'm going to circle the numbers. So 7, 60, and 10. So C, I'm going to do my U, which is how long is the drain pipe? Underline the question. Box the key words. Um, what's to do with length? Um, down is also, I find it quite a key word for me because it means that uh, in this situation, something is being lost. So it's going up and then it's going down. Okay, so that's my box of keywords. So evaluate and draw. Um, now we could maybe draw it if we really wanted to. But here we've got the little spider, baby spider. And it's trying to go up this drain pipe. So it's going up uh, 60 and then down. 10 and that's in the space of one hour yeah and i want to find out what happens in seven hours so whatever that's going on here i'm going to multiply this by seven yeah so let's uh solve it now actually let's put it into a number sentence that's kind of our part of our evaluation process so i'm going to have seven lots seven um and i want to find what length it goes up in an hour. So I'm going to have 60 minus 10. Now I know that's 50, but I want to make sure that this is completely contained in my number sentence. Um, and it tells that story as well. Um, now, 7 times 60 is going to give me 420. That's not what I want. I want to make sure that this 60 minus 10 is done first. So I'll put some grouping symbols around that. Put my equal sign. 60 minus 10 is 50 and 7 times 50 equals 350. Make sure I've answered my question, centimetres, um, or it could be 3.5 metres. And there you go. Um, I've changed this word problem into a number sentence and I've used grouping symbols to make sure that each of the operations is done in the order that I want them to be done in. So I get the right answer. Okay, have a go at today's word problems. I look forward to seeing your responses and I'll see you in lesson four, which is going to be our last uh, video lesson uh, for the week for maths. Thank you. Okay, welcome to lesson four for year six maths for week four. This is the last video lesson I'm going to be doing for this week, even though there's an activity on Friday. The Friday activity really is kind of a revision from different parts in the week. So practicing your fluency um, and rather than your understanding. So the last couple of lessons have been about introducing new understanding, um, getting you to think and work mathematically. That's the same with this lesson. And the one on Friday is more about just using um, those mathematical skills fluently. Today's lesson. Well, we've looked at grouping symbols, but now we're going to look at things called nested grouping symbols. Um, and the success criteria for this is making sure you do the operations inside the innermost grouping symbols first. So we'll look at that in a second. Making sure you do other operations inside other grouping symbols next. Showing you're working out. I haven't really stressed that this week, but you've seen me do it in each of my videos. Um, this is a really important uh, part of mathematics, particularly as you go into high school. I always thought um, our teachers uh, just want to make us do all this working out. What's the point? I can get the answer. Particularly when you go into more complex maths and things like in algebra, it's really important to be able to show you're working out rather than just getting the correct answer. You need to see what processes you've followed 
what method you've used. So even though it seems a bit obvious here and quite simple here, it's a really good practice to get into. And lastly, recognizing situations where nested grouping symbols are needed. Simple, simple similar oh, to what we did um, with the grouping symbols the other day, in the other lesson. So you might be wondering, what are nested grouping symbols? Another kind of grouping symbol? Well, they are really just grouping symbols with inside another set of grouping symbols. So here I've got um, these brackets, five plus three, inside these square brackets. Now the rule is kind of similar to grouping symbols, but the innermost one, the most nested one, has to be done first. And usually, if people have written it correctly, the innermost grouping symbol will be a bracket. That's your most basic one. Like with when we just have one set, we start off with brackets, then we kind of nest it or surround it with other types of grouping symbols. So your next one up would be a square brackets, and the one up from a square brackets are these braces. So there are three main types. But always look for whatever's in the brackets first. Do that. Then you do the other operations, um, kind of moving out, kind of like an onion almost, starting from the middle and then kind of working your way out. Actually, not kind of like an onion, because on an onion you would start on the outside and work your way in. Anyway, you get my idea. Different layers. Start from the middle, then go to the next layer, and then move out. So here, I would do my uh, 5 plus 3 first, which would be 8. Um, then I would have 2 times 8, which is 16, 32. Yep, so let's move this over here. So it's going to be 32 divided by 16, which is 2. Nice doubles fact there. Yep, and with this bottom one here, we've got a little bit more complexity. 5 plus 3 is... 8 again divided by 2, that's my next one, is 4. So 8 divided by 2 times 2 is 8. And so my uh, number sentence is going to be 40 divided by 8. And we know the answer there is 5. Now, normally I would have done the working out below. Um, to make it simpler for myself, so I can see that I'm, make, I'm doing it at each step. So each set of grouping symbols, you probably want to do a new line as you go down, um, so you can keep track of it that way. Okay, so let's have a go at these ones together where I've got a bit more space. So I've got a number sentence, I'm going to scan through it. Okay, well I've got uh, square brackets, so that must mean there's a set of grouping symbols inside, and what do you know? There is. We've got these brackets here, so let's do these ones first. So, now hopefully I've got some space to do some working out. 5 minus 2 is 3. Yeah. And I'm going to write it down here. Now it seems kind of repetitive, um, but it's really useful for when you have a longer um, number sentence. Now I can actually do this bracket one here as well. 4 plus 2, because it's by itself, is 6. Yep. 9 divided by 3 is 3. 6 times 3, my answer is going to be 18. So it's really just a, it's quite, um, these seem to be methodical, it's, even though they look really complex, if you write the number sentences, kind of simplified as you go down, it's, it's much easier to keep track of it, rather than trying to do it all in one go. I really recommend against doing that. Now here, I've actually made a mistake. I probably should have made sure that my uh, equal signs were all in line with one another as well. Yep, so let's just rub that out and make sure that we have it nice and Tidy. So equal sign there. Six times three, eighteen, and there you go. Yep. So all of these number sentences here are equivalent. They're all the same to one another, and they all equal eighteen. This is just the most simplified version. 
So here I've got a Vonga one. Oh my gosh. Um, starting with what's in the um, curved brackets. So three minus one is two. And I'm filling the rest of this here. Let's just use my pen. Hopefully this works. Plus one times eight minus. I'm going to do whatever's in the innermost brackets first here. So it's going to be 10. And here, five minus three is two. Okay. So let's look at this now. Let's keep working down. Eight plus two is 10 plus one is 11. So I've got eight times 11 minus um, 10 divided by two is five. Yep, so I think I'm in a good position. Oh, I'm gonna put my equal sign down there. I've done the same thing. Um, I'm gonna make this nice and neat again. Sorry guys. Ah, here we go. Yep, so I've got eight times 11 minus five, much better. It's closer to the equal sign. Okay, eight times 11 is 88 minus five, 83. And there you go. That's how you do nested grouping symbols, always doing the innermost uh, uh, grouping symbols first and then working your way out and writing each of the simplified number sentences underneath until you get to your answer. So main ideas, always do the innermost operations inside grouping symbols first, show you're working out and check that using the grouping symbols achieves the intended result. Yep, so make sure that whatever's on the other side of the equals sign is the correct answer and that it's actually answering the word problem if you have a word problem. Okay, that's all the video lessons for this week. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. Look forward to seeing you in our lessons next week. If you have any questions about this or as you're working through the um, problems or activities, not too sure what to do, uh, please send me a message um, and I can answer you straight away and hopefully lead you in the right direction. All right, see you next time. Bye.